there is a very tense air in the room as we are here for a uh, philosophy second level showdown. Welcome to the studio, uh, Sean Cordell, who is a lecturer in philosophy, uh, a keen cyclist and ex-chef. <laughs> Um, Derek is a professor of philosophy, a keen motorcyclist and cook. So despite having a, a fair bit in common, there is also a fair bit apart. Now the challenge was, how can we uh, explain some of these modules to students in a very engaging way? And you've both risen to the challenge and have decided that the best thing to do is to have a boxing match. Now I've spoken to Kim Woods about this um, and she tells me that this isn't very uncommon at all. Um, <laughs> so I've come armed with hopefully uh, what I think is important. However, I think it's only right and proper that we talk to students about what's in the module first before you both pose questions questions to each other and we will then uh, evaluate uh, or score who we think uh, has given the best answers. Right, so Derek, A222, yep. second level philosophy course, what is it all about? It is, um, it's got six books covering six of the central areas in philosophy. So it's, the first book is on the self, um, what makes me the same person in 10 years time as I am now. Obviously very important when it comes to law because if I commit a crime now, and they're arrested in 10 years' time, they want to make sure it was me who did the crime. Um, then the philosophy of religion, uh, questions about the nature and existence of God. Uh, then ethics, big questions about right or wrong, is it all a matter of opinion? Can we, um, is the God necessary for there to be right and wrong? Things like that. Uh, then the issues of the mind. Um, do we have minds? Are we just hyper-complicated computers? Um, will our minds survive our bodily death? Things like that. Um, then the nature of knowledge. Um, what is science? How does science differ from the pseudosciences, if there are such things? Uh, maybe astrology might be a pseudoscience. Um, what's the nature of knowledge, certainty, truth, justification, things like that. And then finally, there's a book on political philosophy. Um, so uh, should we obey the law? What do we do if we disagree with laws? Uh, should we obey bad laws? What's civil disobedience, things like that. So really interesting, six massively interesting topics that everybody should study. I mean, those are huge, and yet this book is quite manageable. <laughs> the book is quite manageable. That's because we uh, wrote it very, very carefully, so that um, it, does, it, won't, it won't be overwhelming, but, uh, but will be interesting. Wonderful. So six blocks there, and we're going to, in this boxing match, be taking those blocks and, and having questions, so that will hopefully give students an idea about some of the things that are mentioned within those blocks. Sure. Excellent. Sean, how do they, we then assess students? What, what do they then do with all of these things on A222? Well, as Derek said, A22 is divided into six areas, and for each area there is a book like that one. And quite simply for each book, there will be a TMA, an assignment. Uh, and then at the end of the module, there is a, an exam. Right. That's the assessment on A222. <laughs> <laughs> and what sorts of things are they doing? Are they, is it mainly essay-based? Are they a mixture of activities? Uh, assign the assignments are themselves are, are essays, standard length sort of um, TMAs, essays. Uh, there are other things going on. There's uh, quizzes on the VLE, the virtual learning environment. There is uh, Ask the Author session. So the author of each book um, will run a forum on which you can um, punch us in the face, if you like, or whatever, <laughs> ask us questions about our various books, but the formal assessment is, is, is the standard TMA and the examination at the end. Okay, excellent, lovely. Well, that's great, uh, thank you. I think that's given us a good overview of the module. Um, we have the social media desk, and so if there are any questions that you would like to ask in particular about studying philosophy, um, or about why they always have the answer, well, everybody thinks so, in the quiz, um, then you can pose those to H.J. and Rachel, who will be chatting with you as we go. Um, and then if there's any time at the end, we will put your questions to our panel. Right, so, ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, my umpiring equipment. Ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen welcome, welcome to this, this uh, second, second level, level showdown. showdown. Uh, I'm, going I'm going to explain, explain the rules, the rules now. now. So, uh, so uh, we, have, we Derek have Derek in the blue, blue corner. corner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have, we have Sean, Sean in the red, red corner. corner. <laughs> Each person has up to three minutes to answer as many questions as they can per block. Sean, Sean is going, going to ask, to ask Derek, Derek questions, questions on book one, one and, Derek and Derek will then ask Sean questions, questions on book two, two and, so and so on. But to make it more interesting, interesting neither Derek, Derek nor Sean, Sean have seen the questions. questions. So, so each round will last uh, about, about three minutes, minutes with, with each person, person answering, answering and then, then I am going, going to uh, give them a score from one to five. 
Now, we also have a widget so that at home you can give them a score too to see how well you think they answered the question, where one is not very good at all and five is exceptional. Okay, so speed is the key, gentlemen. You must answer as many questions as possible whilst retaining philosophical accuracy if indeed there is such a thing. <laughs> you are allowed to pass, but doing so is considered very bad form. You must abide by the rules at all time. Keep it clean. My decision is final. So, we're going to start with you, Sean. You have three minutes. Okay, chump. All right, so question one on the self is, what is supposed to be this problem of personal identity? I think it's a forensic problem. So the question is, if I commit a crime now and in some future time they want to arrest somebody, they need to arrest the person who committed the crime. So how do, how do they know who to arrest? They need to arrest somebody who's identical with me now. So the question is, what is personal identity? Okay, good. All right, question two. In the TV comedy Only Fools and Horses, Trigger gets an award for keeping the same broom for 25 years. But during that time, it's had several new heads and several new handles. So none of the actual original parts are still on it. So is it the same broom? And in what sense is it the same broom? I think it is the same broom, uh, probably for two reasons. One, it's performed the same function over that time. And second, it's been spatio-temporally continuous. And what that means is um, at the beginning, when he first bought the broom, it stays in existence as that broom, even though the things change. So at the end, it's still the same broom. OK, good. Right, third question. OK, so yesterday we were in Cambridge and we were at Darwin College, which is your old college. And on the wall in the bar there, if you ever get the chance, there's a picture of a young Derek Matravis in the rugby team. This was 20 odd years ago. OK, so uh, what makes you the same person that you were in that, in that picture? What, if anything? Uh, I think what it is, is um, the, con the fact that my mind has been continuous since then. Well, you know, get a, given a few breaks for a, a drink or two. Um, and so uh, the overlapping mental states between me then and me now. OK, good. Right. Supro suppose that full brain transplants were possible and my brain is removed and replaced with yours. Would we have uh, Derek in a Sean-shaped container or would we have something else or what? I think we would probably have Derek in a Sean-shaped container. That's quite difficult to say. <laughs> <laughs> that is, so what would happen is that, um, let's say the operation took place when uh, we were both asleep. Um, so the Sean body would wake up. And that's the end of that round. <laughs> good question. Very good. Well done. Well done. Now, considering I know very little about this, <laughs> how old do you think Derek did? Uh, I think it was... I'd have to concede that was an admirable show. I'm, I'm reeling, you know. <laughs> I think, for a fact, and I'm going to ask the audience at home what they're voting for, I'm going to give you a four for first effort. <laughs> Very good. It's going to go downhill from now, anyway. Um, yes, right, so next. Next, next questions we have are from Derek to Sean, which is on the philosophy of religion. Sean, could you uh, give a definition of God? A God can be many things. What we can say about God, from, as according to most religions, is as a certain characteristic. It is a divine creator. It is a supernatural entity that has created things and has certain properties of being all-powerful and all-knowing and all-seeing. OK. Um, William Paley came up with the argument from design intended to prove the existence of God. Can you just give us a short version of the argument. Well, Paley used an analogy with a watch. He said if you're on a beach and there's lots of things on a beach like pebbles, you can say why the pebbles got there without some kind of design. It could be random. But he found the watch and said, look at this watch, look at how it works, look at all the pieces moving together. That has to be designed. And from that, somehow he got to the conclusion that the world and all its complicated interlocking functions must have been designed. Hence, there is a designer, hence there is a god. Yeah. And what, if anything, is wrong with Paley's argument? Well, there are several things wrong with it. One is that when we look around, we find a lot of disorganisation. We find things that aren't actually made this way. So what, you know, what's God doing there? Um, also, one of the other things wrong with it is perhaps there was some kind of design in the universe, but why does that mean there's a God? Why do we infer that there's this God with all these properties that we say it has? Just because there appears to be design in the universe, if indeed there is. Yeah, OK. And could, could God make two and three come out as six? Two plus three come out as six? No. 
This will be something that's like. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite like I'm going to take up your time. <laughs> this is a, this. If, if there are any truths that are what we call necessary truths, I, they just cannot. It, it, the, the truth is contained in the very things that you're dealing with. The two and a three makes five. There's nothing else. To make it to make it anything other than that, you'd have to change the, the nature of the twos and the threes, and you'd be doing something else. Okay. If that makes sense. What uh, What's the problem of evil? The problem of evil is basically there's a lot of evil in the world, so how can there be a God that's wholly good? If he was wholly good, he'd stop it. Unless he's wholly good but not wholly powerful and can't stop it. In which case, you've either got, he's either not wholly good or not very powerful, or not wholly powerful, and those are two things that supposedly we attribute as properties of God. So okay. he fails somewhere, it can't be the God we think it is. And what, what is a miracle? A miracle is a supernatural event that occurs with, because of divine assistance or intervention. And why did the Scots philosopher David Hume not believe in miracles? He thought that um, uh, the likelihood of a miracle occurring based on the... Uh, oh, we're out of time, <laughs> sorry. Thank God for, <laughs> thank God for that. Oh. There we go. Oh, very, well. <laughs> very, very good. Well done. Um, so, I can't believe a philosopher actually said no. <laughs> How do you think Sean did? I think he did superbly. That was a tough round. It was that very, was, yeah. it was a very, very, very tough very, round. Very, 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 I am giving well. Sean a five oh, for that five. one. Oh, what has everyone at home given Sean? <laughs> I forgot to ask about Derek. Well, Derek came in strong with first round. We're very pleased with his performance. He uh, had a strong four at home. But, uh... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Davin's just said a miracle is me opening a packet of hobnobs and not eating the entire packet. <laughs> I'm not sure if that sorts the <laughs> fits the philosophical definition. Do we think? Or if you needed supernatural help. But I think uh, Sean, we've got a strong four at home as well. We're quite confident oh, that. Uh, yeah. So we're neck and neck on the, after round one and two. I think. Lovely. And would you keep score for me because. Uh, you know how bad I am at that. Lovely, right. Next, Next round, round, we have, we have Sean to Derek, Derek on, on knowledge. knowledge. Okay, hang on. <laughs> okay. Derek, is there a difference between scientific knowledge and other sorts of knowledge? Yes, I am going to follow Karl Popper on this and think that scientific knowledge is knowledge that can be shown to be false. So there, um, you, you have a scientific... It's a very simple scientific claim that all swans are white. All you need to do is find a black swan, and that's shown that that bit of knowledge is not, in fact, knowledge. OK. Um, is it possible to know that some event will happen or something will be true in the future? Ooh. I know, low blow, low blow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I th uh, yes. I think you can. So uh, some people think that there's a problem that we about knowing that the sun will rise tomorrow because it's possible. It's just possible that the sun won't rise tomorrow. If it's possible the sun won't rise tomorrow, then we don't know the sun will rise tomorrow. But I think that we can generalise from our past experience and make that a claim to knowledge. So yes, we do know the sun will rise tomorrow. Okay. Uh, tell us what. Tell us about scepticism. What is scepticism about knowledge, and why has it bothered philosophers? Well, there are many varieties of scepticism. Um, uh, Here's, here's a view. Um, how, do I, how do I know that I'm not dreaming? How do I know this isn't a terrible nightmare? Well, I don't. I could just be, I could just be lying in bed. And if I'm just lying in bed, then I don't know that you're sitting in front of me. And that's, uh, so the sceptical claim is the claim that what we think we know, we don't know because there are other possibilities that we're asleep or we've been deceived by an de evil demon or something like that. OK, good. And can we defeat scepticism as philosophers? I think ultimately we probably can't. I right. think ultimately um, scepticism can't be refuted. Duh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, philosophers distinguish between, uh, with their fancy Latin, they distinguish between knowledge a priori and knowledge a posteriori. Right. Uh, what is this distinction and how is it applied and why does it matter? Well, a priori knowledge um, is knowledge that you can just gain from sitting in your armchair and thinking. So you might gain, for example, going back to our earlier example, that 2 plus 3 equals 5. You don't need to go around the world to find that out. A posteriori knowledge is knowledge based on experience. You have to go around the world and experience things in order to know that they're true. OK. And I'm going to go back. This is touches on one of your answers earlier, but what does it mean to say that a scientific hypothesis is falsifiable? And why does this matter? What does this matter for our claiming to know things scientifically? 
Okay, what it means is it's falsifiable is that it can be shown to be false. But the trouble is, it's actually quite difficult in practice to know whether you falsified something or not. Because, you know, something might have gone wrong with your sight or the... And you're out of time. <sighs> Very good. Very good. How do you think Derek did? I think he did very well. I've still I've got more questions about falsifiability, but they're just general questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's not about his performance. It just uh, anyway. But yeah, I think he did very well. Good stuff. Yes. Okay. Unfold. See, this this is where these scales just aren't very good. I, I have to I have to give a five. Yay! For Derek, um, and see what everybody at home has said. I can't believe you're actually getting through these questions so quickly. Honestly, I really thought it would be a lot more complicated. It, it, it is. actually is. <laughs> and, and I think I can see the beauty and philosophy, but I am so glad I'm not doing it right now. It's a be the beautiful game. <laughs> HJ and Rachel, how's everyone at home? Uh, enjoying, enjoying this. Karen's just said, uh, this is a brilliant recap for me on this course. So that's, uh, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> so exactly what she needs. Uh, at home, everyone voted uh, four for the last one as well. So, brilliant. Uh, They're being four. tough with their points, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm making you work for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'd like to tell us why you voted for or any suggestions that you've got about any of the issues that maybe haven't been covered. And Karen, if you've done the module before, tell everyone what you thought of it. Um, and I'm glad to see that you think this is a good representation of what's in it. Because I know you've both been revised Advising. Oh. <laughs> very, <laughs> very hard. Uh, I know it all a priori. <laughs> I mean, training, sorry. Training. Yes, training. I, I know you've been training very, very hard uh, on all of this. Okay, so next. We have. Ah, uh, that's going to be a good one. Yeah. Derek, Derek to Sean, Sean on ethics. ethics. Let me get ready. State the theory of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, in classical form, says that what is good or what is the right action will be the one that produces the most good overall or the most utility. So the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Okay. And here's a, a low blow. Name at least three of Plato's four virtues. Uh, wisdom, knowledge, uh, and uh, justice. Whoa, okay. <laughs> knowledge is, oh, no, no is wisdom, cool. courage, self-discipline and justice. That's, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> what's, the yeah. biggest pro Ooh. what's the biggest problem for the utilitarian view? The, the problem for the utilitarian view, I think the biggest problem is it doesn't capture some of what really matters. Uh, uh, I was going to use the word phenomenologically, but what we experience in the world as being right or wrong and good and bad things, it fails sometimes to capture those. So it fails to capture... For example, if, if the right action is going to be the one that, um, you know, uh, it's, it gave some happiness to 100 people and one had, was in abject misery, it doesn't capture the fact that you just can't, it's just wrong to put someone through ab abject misery sometimes, per yeah. se. Okay, what according to the great Greek boxer Plato is the connection between <laughs> being just and having an ordered mind? Well, justice accords with what Plato th thought uh, was a rational part of the soul. Plato divided the soul into three components. I'm going to get these wrong as well, aren't I? No, <laughs> rationality, appetite, and desire. Is that right? <laughs> and, but and, but the, the justice was the exercise and in accordance with the rational part of the soul, which was the highest activity. It's what the philosophers did, and it's what the, the truly happy, good people would uh, would do. Okay. Um, changing tack. Give one. Give one of the formulations of Kant's categorical imperative. Um, act. Always act as if by your will this would become universal law. So what that means is that anything you do should be, you should be able to say that, well, this could be a law that applies to everyone and it would still work. Knock out. Um, <laughs> state Judith Jarvis Thompson's famous analogy to being pregnant. Well, she's, the analogy is of a uh, being hooked up, well, if I, if I may, it would, an unwanted pregnancy would be an analogy to being suddenly waking up to find yourself hooked up to a famous violinist who depends on you to live. Uh, the thought being that you don't actually have an obligation to keep them alive, as you don't to a fetus that is unwanted. And do you think that the cases are analogous? There are disanalogies with it. Uh, it namely, the most obvious one is a fetus is internal to a person. Uh, it's something that's grown inside of you. Now, to some people that's irrelevant, to, to other people that just makes, makes a, bi a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <I> Woo! <laughs> I think... Uh... 
I got need a sponge down. I got one of Plato's virtues wrong. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs> That's the end. <laughs> Apart from that, how did how did Sean do? Uh, knockout. Very I, good. I stuff. think to be fair, that was possibly the most difficult. Yeah, that's putting difficult you on the spot. Round. Not really. Yeah. You should not. <laughs> <laughs> not the Republic. I think that was that was tricky. It was tricky, uh, and so I'm going to have to give you a three for that. <laughs> how did everyone think that Sean three. did at home? Well, we've actually got a mix between uh, four and five here. We've, we've got really? an, an even split. Can we do half points? Is that allowed? <laughs> Are we allowing that? <laughs> I think they all felt sorry for you. Mm. But we're definitely enjoying. I think... Um, Careful. <laughs> Sharon's asked a, a great question. She wants to know just briefly, how do you know what is false when you don't know the truth and vice versa? I think that's very interesting to think about. Do we have any answers? Perhaps a bonus point in there. Isn't, isn't, the, isn't the question about falsifiable? You don't actually have to go and find out something's false. It could be susceptible to a... I don't know. I'm, I'm not, this is something I need to know more about. But, so. This is an email reply, right? Okay. So, uh, so uh, if you email us, Sharon, uh, studenthub at open.ac.uk, we'll give uh, our lovely colleagues some assignment work to do for you and get back to you on that. Right. Without further ado, we have uh, um, Sean to Derek on... This will be an interesting one. Mind. Right. Okay, Derek. Um, is on. My rules. Beg your pardon. Wait. <laughs> Ready? Okay, Derek. Isn't mind just the same thing as, or just another name for the brain, or what goes on in the brain? And if it isn't, why not? And so what? Oh, um, what it is to have a mind is for certain, um, certain things to be true of you, namely that you have things like beliefs, desires, thoughts, visualizations, dreams, that kind of thing. So then the question is, do we have these properties just because we have brains or do we need something like a soul or spirit or something like that? I think most philosophers these days, although not all of them, would say that uh, we have these things because we have brains. So in some sense, the mind is identical to the brain, but it's got very special properties of the brain, not just it's being meat. OK, that's good. <laughs> All right, chapter four of book five in A222 is about the problem of consciousness. What the hell is that? I'm glad you asked me that. Um, the problem <laughs> of consciousness, I suppose it's, it's this, is um, what is the, there's, a, there's a post here that's not conscious. Uh, I am conscious. It's not dark inside, to use a great phrase that philosophers some, sometimes use. And the question is, how can we understand this difference? What is, what is consciousness? And I, I think, actually, that's one of the most difficult questions there is in philosophy. OK, good. I think that's a bit of a low blow on that one because that's quite a difficult question. Yeah, thank you very much, Rep. So, <laughs> so, so diff a difficult question in philosophy is a low blow. Uh, yes. OK. Right, OK, here's, here's uh, hopefully within Queensbury rules. I keep things in mind or I remind myself using things outside of my physical brain. So are these things like phone alerts or mementos or diaries, are they part of my mind? Well, uh, a couple of philosophers think so, um, Andy Clark and David Chalmers. Mm. So um, I, when I want to go to the museum, I could either just remember something that's located somewhere in my mind, my brain, or I could look on this bit of paper that I carry around in my pocket. What's the difference between those two things? Um, they think that there is no difference, that the bit of paper in my pocket is actually an extension of my mind. OK. Right. Can a sophisticated computer do exactly what a mind can? Uh, about 14% of what a mind can. Sorry. <laughs> Out of time. <laughs> 14%. Right, let's have a sponge up. Do you gentlemen need any water? I've got... Oh, I think I'm all right. Thank you. Right. OK. Good. Oh, I don't think I did very well then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Difficult, difficult mm. round. Mm. Okay, but I think you handled it very well. I'd like to see what everyone at home says first. Well, uh, I think we're we're taking sides here. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got. Um, well, I've decided I'm definitely on Team Sean for this one, <laughs> but uh, I, th I think Rachel's uh, decided to go the other way and uh, is on Team Derek. So well, we uh, can't all sort of stand behind Sean and go, yay! <laughs> <laughs> and then Derek's on his own, can we? Right, right. Come right, on. right. But, uh, we seem to be a bit split in the chat, but um, 
Ben thinks your ruling, Karen, was a bit dubious, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, we'll see, but... Um... It's my match and my rules. <laughs> and that's that. We'll, we'll make sure to tell him that, but uh, I think we're we're awarding a four for this one on Team Home. We are, we are. The thing is, as well, this is generating a lot of questions, isn't it, in the chat? Mm. There's a lot of a lot of questions, uh, philosophical questions, uh, that people are sort of starting to, uh, to ask. So, uh, yeah... Yeah, I think uh, Lucy just said, uh, uh, which I think is really interesting, a lot of this course crosses over into science as well, and she wants to know if that's common in philosophy. I think, uh, if, if I may take that one, I, th I think um, increasingly so. So, so there, there, are, there are scientific questions which are best answered by scientists in laboratories, and there are philosophical questions which are best answered. Um, the fundamental questions tend to be philosophical questions. The, the, the scientists might look and find that they're bits of the brain that light up whenever we're in pain. But the philosophical question is going to be, what's the relation between pain and that bit of the brain lighting up? Is it identity? Is it just correlation? Is there a law between them? And those are all kind of philosophical questions that we need to ask. Mm. But philosophy does listen to science a lot more than it used to, I think that's fair to say. I, I agree, it does. Wonderful. Well, you know, they're not the Queensbury rules. This is the Arts Hub rules. I have also awarded Yay! a four for this. Four. Um, generous, generous. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Ben, I actually just wanted to blow the whistle because Kim gave this to me earlier, <laughs> um, which she uh, uses in department meetings, and I was really surprised that none of them were shocked. <laughs> right. Final. Final round. Okay. okay so, so we, we have, have uh, Derek, Derek to Sean. To Sean. You'll, You'll like, like this, this. On, on political, political philosophy. philosophy. Let me get ready. And you may start now. Why should I obey the laws of the state? There are various reasons. One might just be prudence, because you'd get punished and you get put away. That tends to be unsatisfactory uh, for philosophers. They want a reason of why, you know, su suppose you could get away with it, well, should you? And there are various ways of answering that. Uh, one is that you owe it to the state. One is a reciprocity. You, you get protection from the state. Uh, the state w would protect you from certain things and provide you with security and so on. So you owe it. You, 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 it, it, it is a sort of, you, know, you are participating. You shouldn't be a free rider. You shouldn't just take the gains and, and look after yourself. You owe it. That's just one. There are others, but I'm not. OK. State, state what philosophy means by civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is the deliberate disobedience of a law, a law of the state, uh, because one simply does not tolerate it. One sees it as unjust. Uh, I mean, suffragettes, for example, exercised civil disobedience because they rightly thought that the law that, that didn't give women suffrage was completely unjust. And you weren't, they weren't, they were in no position to change it by the electoral system because they didn't have the vote. <laughs> is, uh, here's a tricky one. Is inequality all right if it's the result of different levels of effort by different people? That, that is a contentious subject. Um, egalitarians would say, uh, oh, sorry, look egalitarians, would, would, there are look egalitarians who say that look should be eliminated. So, you know, that's, so, uh, sorry, it shouldn't be a matter of look. So yes, it should be, if, if it's a matter of effort, then, then fine. If, you, if you're getting something from what you're putting in, that's all right. What you shouldn't be getting is something that somebody else isn't getting just by luck, just by the I fact think. you happen to have been born to it or whatever. What noted book in the in A222 book six is there explicit argument for vegetarianism? Say that again. <laughs> 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 well, we're out of time. <laughs> 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 oh, that was a trick Sorry. <laughs> we're out of time. Okay. What you was it? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're out of time, but what was the question? What great book of modern political philosophy is there an explicit argument for vegetarianism? Oh, right. Uh, the... We are out of time. Okay. <laughs> Is that what you need to make? <laughs> Sorry, Rev. Tell us Sorry, your Rev. It was Anarchy State and Utopia. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Robert Nozick. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, I think I think we're giving another four for Yay. that. <laughs> and I haven't been adding all of that up. HJ, where does that leave everybody? Uh, and who has won? I think uh, Sean's slightly ahead by half a point. Oh. Right. So just snipped it, eh? Oh, well done. Oh. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Don't know how that happened. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for, um, for both coming in and being such fabulous sports. I think this is a really good example for students about the exam. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, what, because you can you can recall things. You can recall things quickly. Coherent, You've given a very nice except solid. Plato's wrap up. virtues. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I bet that the exam for students, whilst those can be scary, is in no way as scary uh, as it has been coming here and answering all these questions on live TV. See, never, never straight answer with these. <laughs> Derek and Sean, thank you very thank much. You That's very been much. absolutely wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. you enjoyed it. We are going now for um, a short audio break, I believe. Um, and then we're back for um, a lovely picnic with the Classical Studies uh, Department. Uh, so we'll see you very soon. Grab a cup of tea. Um, and uh, don't forget to let us know if you've got any questions, either about philosophy or classical studies, and we will try and answer that. And if there is anything we haven't managed to answer, email us studenthub at open.ac.uk, and we will delegate that to somebody and get them to reply to you. See you soon. <laughs>